When building a raised garden bed, the size of the bed and the type of materials you use is really up to you. But for demonstration purposes, I'm going to show how to build a raised garden bed using red cedar decking. Cedar is naturally water resistant without being pressure treated. If you're not using cedar and concerned that the wood might rot or decay from being in contact with soil or water, you can always add a plastic liner to the interior of the bed to slow down that process. For this project, I wanted the garden bed to be 12 inches tall, so I decided to use two 2x6 two pieces for the sides and 2x4s for stakes and to finish the top edge. Because my raised garden bed is going to be 12 inches high, I want to have some stakes that are going to extend into the ground and provide support. So I cut those stakes at 18 inches, and I found that cutting the stakes to a point, as you can see here in the video, really helps to make sure that it's easy to drive those stakes into the ground when I'm installing the bed. Additionally, I use red cedar 4x4 timber, and I cut those at 18 inches as well and use those for all of the corner posts. I prefer to use exterior coated decking screws, but you could also use lag bolts or other hardware options that are rated for exterior use. I always advise drilling pilot holes prior to installing screws to prevent any wood splitting near the edges. I find it very helpful to have a lot of these clamps available. I tend to use about 8 to 10 at a time when I'm doing each side of the garden bed. Here I'm using the clamps to secure two 2x6 two pieces together to give me that edge. And this is the short end of the bed, so this is one of the four foot sections. I found that having one stake at the end of each of the shorter ends of the beds is more than sufficient and provides enough support for the bed. As you can see here, I've got all of my stakes attached to the sides. This gives me an opportunity to test fit all of the pieces and make sure that they're square and that everything aligns well together. Once I know that the bed is square and level, I'll drill holes at the end of each piece of wood. Doing this will help me make sure that when I attach the screws, I can hopefully avoid any splitting. Because I want the corners to be strong and have a lot of support, I used three and a half inch exterior coated deck screws with this application. Once the corners are secured, then I add the corner posts and I check one more time to make sure the bed is level before transferring it to its destination. This is a great opportunity to place the bed in the location you prefer and make any markings for the boundaries so that you know where to start digging with your shovel and either remove the grass from this location or consider putting down a landscape fabric or cardboard to reduce weed pressure and help plants root more effectively. Once all four sides of the garden bed come in contact with the soil, I know that the garden bed is level. I'll then begin to add compost. One modification I like to make is to add these half-inch pipe clamps to each of the interior stakes. I add one below the soil surface that you can't see here. And in corners where I don't have stakes located, I measure an inch and a half off the edge of the raised garden bed to ensure that the pipe clamps are located equal distance away from the edge so I can add rebar and PVC later on for season extension. Installing rebar at the corners and at each stake provides an excellent foundation for adding PVC or some other type of piping to create a low tunnel. This raised garden bed was used for a classroom demonstration, but you can see how the PVC can be attached to the rebar. And we later added plastic to complete the demonstration. Now that my rebar has been installed, I can go ahead and finish adding all of my compost. And I can finish the top edge by adding some 2x4s. Then I can add my seeds and my transplants. Thank you for watching this demonstration video on building a raised garden bed. I hope you found it helpful and informative. Please feel free to reach out and contact me if you have any questions or reach out to your local extension office. And to learn more about workshops and events happening throughout Indiana and in your community, please visit us online at extension.purdue.edu and on social media. So oftentimes um, when, when working with urban growers in particular, I'll either be asked uh, why would they need to build or why should they build raised garden beds? Or I may be interacting with someone who is already planning to use a raised garden bed and, I, and I'm kind of curious as to why, <clears throat> excuse me, and if there is a known contamination or, or a reason why they may be doing that. And oftentimes some of the answers that I either provide or they provide in those situations are, it may just be for aesthetic purposes. They may find that it, it, that it would look better on their property. Um, it may be an issue just as simple as compacted soil and, and poor drainage because of that. Also poor nutrient status, if they've, if they've done some soil testing, they're aware, maybe they've tried growing in their native soil in the past. Additionally, there may be issues with weed or pathogen management concerns. So um, <clears throat> that's something I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, that I tried to mention before in that video or that comes up quite a bit. Um, and, and finally too, I think probably the most, um, most conversation I have with folks are related to potential or known contamination in urban soils. So the different raised guard, sorry, different raised bed types are typically supported raised beds and that can be used with either wood, stone, um, cedar block. There are a lot of urban growers I've seen you use cedar, cedar blocks and do different, different um, bed configurations with that. I'm seeing a lot more people use 
either plastic or different composite materials. It gives people an opportunity to either build up or outward or expand in different ways because of those modular designs. Um, I typically recommend people use uh, untreated wood or untreated lumber. Again, there are many, I, I've heard a lot of differing, differing opinions on this. A lot of people will say that um, more, more of the modern copper compounds are not as harmful as, as ones used in the past. Again, I tend to err on the set of caution on this and just recommend that people use a rot resistant species like cedar for that purpose. In, in, in ground beds, I, you, you know, again, you don't have to use a, a supported structure to, to do that. As again, you can see here on the bottom right photo at Johnny May Farm in Fort Wayne. They're using uh, mounds of compost with a flat top to put their transplants or seeds in. And you know, again, you can bring in new soil or remove existing pathways from soils that can kind of help create a, um, you know, a drainage, a, a drainage channel for you too. And that can, that can be another option. And again, this doing just a, tip, a regular in-ground braised bed like this can be um, very cost effective and can be a great way to maximize space. So some of the raised bed advantages are, you know, if you're in a situation where you're really limited in space, so let's say you've got a lot of, um, you have a very limited uh, lawn or turf area to grow in. And I'm, I'm thinking of people like Will Allen from Growing Power in Milwaukee who may, um, who's often used compost on top of asphalt parking lots. Again, not ideal, but it gives you an option to at least grow in a situation like that. Um, for some folks, it may be as simple as just increase high, or increasing their hydro accessibility so they can harvest more easily. Again, maybe due to a physical disability or some issue that may, that may drive them to consider that. Again, wanting to reduce compaction and improve soil drainage is, is a great way to impact vegetable production and increase vegetable production. And one thing I think I, I, I've kind of noticed, I think is most helpful and even for me, I can attest to is increasing the spring soil temperature by having a raised bed. You're gonna be able to grow earlier and do more, I think, early in, in, in those systems. But again, um, you know, the, that also gives you the option too to consider the season extension or low tunnels like I mentioned in the video. And, a, and another important thing for many people too is just having the opportunity to create whatever growing medium they want, whether they want to use compost, incorporate peat moss, or maybe even incorporate some of that native soil and other amendments into their project. But some of the raised beds, sorry, some of the raised bed challenges I want to mention are material expense or time consideration. Like the, the eight by four by one foot bed I mentioned earlier, if you're gonna purchase two by material in cedar, that can you know, run as much as $200 or more. It can take a lot of time, both in building or preparing and, and, and getting your site prepared for those installations too for a supported raised bed. Um, and sometimes too, if you don't have consistent irrigation, your beds can dry out quickly. I can, I can personally attest to that too. And with that um, consistent irrigation being required or that constant um, flush of, of um, Water too, I've, I've really noticed too, a lot of folks have expressed just an increased need for more fertilization more often, um, maybe even higher input. So that's definitely a concern. Um, maintenance can also be another concern or a challenge too. And in, in this photo on the right, the community hospital gardens in Anderson, Indiana, they're using a composite material. But here you can already see, I think it's only, it was only installed maybe just less than a year at that point. You can see some of the panels on that bed are already starting to bow outward from the weight of, of wet soil. And, I, and again, I think if you're using like a one by material, that's likely gonna to happen too. You might find yourself having to add more stakes both on the inside or outside to create support for that, for some of those beds. And again, some of those wood species, if you're not using a cedar or something that's rot resistant will eventually rot. You may find yourself in five or six years having to replace those materials. And you might find too, just that with this, um, you have some constraints regarding irrigation. It may, may be in a situation where some vegetables may just not grow well. So for site assessment, um, you want to consider, I think probably the one, primary thing you want to look at is sun. You know, get a good sense for your site. If you live there for a while, you probably already know, you know, what areas of your uh, property are going to get hit with the most amount of sun. Again, you're looking at six full hours a day. Uh, irrigation is another important concern. I can't tell you how many times I've uh, worked on a project or, or visited someone working on a project where they picked an uh, ideal or optimal area, but they forgot to consider the, the location. Maybe their spigot is on the other side of the house or far away and, and rainwater harvesting may or may not be an option. So this is something to consider too. Um, slope and drainage. On, so for this photo on the right, um, I want to uh, make a note that, you know, in a situation like this, if you're trying to grow that, uh, grow, you know, vegetables, even on a, a mild slope like that, you might find that you're getting a lot of erosion or, or runoff and, and various things too. So I think it'd give you a good opportunity if you've got a slope to be able to level that out and install a bed. Um, and, and I think most importantly too, for urban growers is the environmental safety component. So, I mean, really take some time to get to know your site, um, talk to your neighbors, try to figure out is there any known industry or, um, you know, commercial property or, or, or different things that have occurred in your, 
either in your neighborhood or even in adjacent parcels and whatnot, with something, again, previously zoned commercially. Um, the research records, look at your site use history. IDEN can be a great resource for that too, just to try to determine if you have an environmental restrictive covenant or maybe there's an ordinance in your neighborhood or, or in your city that prevents agricultural use or even using um, a well for groundwater. And then finally too, I think it's important, even if you're going to, you know you're gonna use raised beds, even if it's just for aesthetic purposes, and there's any potential for urban contaminants, so maybe even consider still doing a, some type of soil sampling event and getting your soil tested, because you may find at some point down the road that you may wanna grow in that field soil or you're working very often in those field soils too and you have the potential to either um, inhale contaminated soil particles or some of those particles may, may transport themselves onto the uh, crops you're, you're harvesting. So for soil sampling, this is a slide I share very often in, in, different, um, in, in different presentations, but that you know, always use, always use comp, um, composite sampling, try to at least get a sub, uh, five subsamples for every one sample you're gonna submit to the lab. And again, that, that table at the bottom is helpful, but again, I think focusing on gardens here, we wanna encourage people to sample at least six inches deep on all of those samples that they're gonna collect. And, and this is one thing I, 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 I kind of try to stress with growers too, again, if you don't have a soil probe or whatever tools you're probably commonly using are more than sufficient to collect your soil sample, use a shovel, trowel, whatever you've got available. And then, uh, you know, get, all, get those materials, your, your different samples into a bucket, mix them up, collect a sample from that and, and submit that for your, lab, for your lab analysis. So oftentimes after that, again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about primarily urban growers here, is looking at your soil test results and trying to figure out, okay, what's the, what's the best path forward here in terms of your nutrient status, your soil health? What are you gonna do? What's your nutrient management plan or your irrigation plan gonna look like here? And how's it gonna impact the crop production plan that you have in mind? And how are you gonna you know, optimize your crop production? Those are, those are typically first concerns. But again, if you're gonna do that soil test and there's any concern or consideration of um, you know, potential for contamination, you really wanna have that you know, analyzed for heavy metals as well. The typical drivers are lead, arsenic, again, cadmium, chromium, mercury are all important too. And I think I was just in a meeting yesterday with someone in Gary, Indiana, and they were really concerned. They don't even know whether um, what the site history is or um, if there's even adjacent properties that may be impacting them, but they're already considering installing raised beds and using them just out of fear that heavy metals may be present. I include this slide too, sorry. <clears throat> include this slide too, just from a tetrachloroethylene plume, and, a, and this was near a residential neighborhood in Indianapolis, and that this is something I try to show people sometimes, not to incite fear, but that if you're wanting to use a, a, a groundwater well and you're in an urban environment, in particular someone like Lake County or uh, Marion County, to just keep an eye out for things like this or try to know as much as you can about the site so that you're not drawing you know, well water out of an area that may have a plume, and you're irrigating that or maybe using that for human consumption. And so some other things to consider for preparing your site, start early, think of the year before in the summer or fall, consider the height and width of the bed and you know, maybe even consider preparing a, a stale seed bed using a tarp as shown on the right there. Um, know your weeds and unfortunately we have a weed specialist available here who's gonna present afterwards so you can go in more detail on this. But you know, again, sometimes tilling can equal more weeds, it can create more problems too. So uh, try to consider those things and you know, some weeds are harder to manage than others as, as we all know. Cons uh, consider you know, how you're gonna kill existing vegetation are you gonna use chemical or are you gonna use organic methods? Um, what's your initial kill gonna look like and what's the ongoing maintenance gonna be involved so that you can maintain your site? Some irrigation considerations to, uh, to, to think about too are, would you like to use soaker hoses? A lot of people use drip tubes. Um, in my experience, a lot of sprinklers can, can create pathogen issues. Again, I think it, it depends on how often or if there are any kind of dormant pathogens um, currently available in that soil or native soil. And again, I, I wanna kind of drive home the point again too that Inconsistent irrigation and well-drained beds can really cause a lot of plant stress. And I think that's one thing I probably notice more often than not when visiting farms is just that um, just they weren't anticipating or expecting that the level of irrigation required to keep those crops um, growing well and, and, and producing optimally. And so finally, I want to mention some compost and amendment considerations. I think it's important to know if you've got a reliable supplier, um, what are their compost methods? Are they, are they providing a finished compost? What are their feedstocks and, and do they have an analysis available they could supply you? I think of um, many times I, you know, I can think of when I purchased uh, bags of compost from the you know, local big box store. Most of, those, most of those packages don't provide an analysis or any um, parameters of the compost that I'm purchasing. So 
if you're if you're working with someone like that that you trust and they're getting their compost tested, just ask them if they can provide um, a data sheet or analysis on that to give you some um, inclination of what you know what the pH may be or what the C to N ratio may be. And again, when I get asked a lot of times, what for you know the volume of a, a bed, how much compost should, should, should they consider buying? Um, I, I always mention this that for the eight by four by one foot depth, it, it does require a little bit more than ER because most compost companies will only you have like a one cubic yard minimum delivery. And I've made the mistake of, you know, being cheap and just paying for one cubic yard and having to go to the big box store and buy those couple of bags afterwards. So um, use that sort of as a rule of thumb, but obviously it um, may vary in your situation. And again, avoid contaminated soil or fill. I can think of many examples in, in urban environments where it's been all too tempting. You, there's a excavation happening or maybe there's construction in a, in a nearby area and it's easy to go pick up that soil and transport it to your site. But you may not know the history of that or it may have debris or contaminants in it. And finally, I think it's important to mention it, as an amendment, peat can be helpful. I, I know a lot of growers who use peat because maybe their compost is high seven, 7.8. Um, peat can really help impact that or, or lower the pH in, in a, you know, a growing season or two. Of course, other amendments can be considered too, but I'm just primarily focusing on compost and peat for this application. And then again, mulching around plants. You wanna make sure that you're um, keeping your soil temperature down, your soil's not drying out in the garden bed because that can happen very easily. And I always recommend too for people to mulch their pathways. Again, if you're in an urban environment, you have any concern that you may have contaminants present, it's best to do that as a best management practice just to avoid any potential for soil, um, you know, getting on your clothing, transporting that from the crop into your home, or even if children or, or um, you know, people with immune compromised systems are working in those areas too. It's just a great, great way to prevent that exposure route. So that is all. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to hand it off to Stephen Myers. And We're going to talk uh, next about some weed management. Um, this is a talk that I've given before to just kind of specialty crop producers in the past. And so I'm going to try to uh, when I get to slides that I think may be more pertinent or, or kind of different for uh, small farms, I'll go ahead and kind of try to illuminate some of uh, what I think may be uh, unique to small farms. Um, so to go ahead and get us started here. Um, so this is an outline. We're just going to kind of talk about why weeds are bad, um, touch on different ways to manage them, and then we'll provide some resources at the end that will hopefully be useful to the group. Um, the first thing that I like to start off with is um, the question that I get a lot, you know, July, August, sometimes in June, um, a grower will send me a photo of four foot tall pigweed in their peppers, or in this case, curly dock um, in an annual plastic culture strawberry field. And they'll say, what do I do? Um, and in specialty crops, there's not a lot that we can do once we get this far gone. So the thing that I want to try to start off with when it comes to weed management is to kind of focus on being proactive and not reactive. So kind of planning for, for weed management, um, focusing on prevention and not curative controls, and then considering integrated approaches. So not just waiting until weeds are emerged and then saying, okay, now what do I do? What do I spray on them? I'm trying to, trying to come at it from an integrated perspective. The, uh, so often we say that weeds are, you know, quote, bad. And the reason that we say that is because they compete with our crops for light, water, and nutrients, um, which reduces yield, but it also reduces quality. So on the photo, this is a blueberry photos here on the screen. That top one is actually, um, uh, you know, maybe a one-year-old blueberry bush, but you can hardly see it for all the weeds that are growing around it. That are obviously competing with that plant for, for light, water, and nutrients. Uh, they can reduce harvesting efficiency, whether that's mechanical harvest or hand harvesting. They can host plant pathogens. So the thing that I often think about is uh, if you're growing brambles, raspberries, blackberries, usually you want to try to eradicate the, uh, the wild brambles around you because they can serve as a host for different, uh, for example, viruses that can be vectored um, to the, the crop that you're growing. They can be allergens. So in the case of poison ivy, which can grow in blueberry and blackberry fields, um, and some of our orchard crops, um, you know, that can cause dermatitis on your skin if you're, if you're picking or, or in, um, you know, orchard crops like that that have poison ivy. And they can be unattractive. So if you have a U-pick, um, people don't want to uh, trip over weeds or, or you know, get stuck by thistles or anything when they're trying to, to pick in your U-pick operation. The one thing that I've experienced when I talk to small farm, small farmers, 
um, is that a lot of them say they don't have weed issues, or if they do, they say, yeah, we have weeds, but they don't, they don't cause us any problems. And, and so I, before this presentation, I was kind of thinking about why that might be. And I think a lot of times the impacts of weeds are subtle, right? So these are two tomato fruits out of uh, our little micro farm here in West Lafayette. And, you know, one has a, a disease problem, bacterial speck or spot on the left. One has tomato fruit worm damage. Um, those are obviously not marketable fruit now. Um, and it's, it's really clear what caused that impact. But when it comes to weeds, it's a little more subtle to see um, were there less tomato fruit on each plant that had weeds or were they just smaller? Um, is, the visual is not as impactful as it is with some of these other pests. To give you an example of that, this is from a, the corn patch at my, my place here. So um, it's, uh, the corn was three foot apart on centers uh, in the row, you know, eight to 10 inches. And the field was weed free with the exception of the edge of the field which had giant foxtail and velvet leaf and some Canada thistle growing pretty much right up against the, uh, the edge of the field. So that ear on the left is from the center of the field that was weed free. The ear on the right is from a portion of the field that was weedy on one side. And so, if it, you know, again, it's really subtle. If you, if you didn't ha have, you know, two different conditions and the ability to put these two ears next to each other, you might never notice that, that the weeds actually were having an impact on, on something like ear size of sweet corn. So one of the things that we need to consider is that the weeds that we must contend with are kind of a product of our production systems. So these are two different crops that I worked with when I was in uh, North Carolina as a graduate student. So one is sweet potato, it's a warm season annual crop. The other was blueberry, which is a perennial bush crop. Right, so if you look at the 10 most troublesome weeds for both of these crops, they're completely different. And that's because of the way the crops are produced. For example, in sweet potato, only one of those top 10 weeds are perennial because we're constantly you know, tilling the soil with uh, you know, pre preparation tillage and then the harvest process itself is kind of a tillage event. But if you look at something like uh, blueberry, you put the plants in the ground and you hope to harvest for the next two decades or more off of those. And you start to see not only annual weeds, but perennial weeds start to creep in. So things like this needle leaf rosette grass is a perennial grass. Um, for example, Miss Marilyn Meadowview's a, beauty is a, a, a perennial uh, flowering plant. We see vines like greenbrier and Carolina jasmine and even some tree species start to, to, to creep in as well. So if you're thinking about managing these two crops, the species that we have to, to deal with are completely different. Another thing that kind of dictates the weeds that, that we have to contend with is the way that we manage our crops. So this was taken last August at a, a pumpkin field in, at the Penny Purdue Ag Center up at uh, Wanata. And this was part of a no-till pumpkin demonstration. And so the photo on the left is, uh, had cover crop, which I think was rye. And they didn't have a lot of biomass, so they had some weeds come through. It didn't get tilled, and you can see it's predominantly mare's tail, or what some people call horseweed or Canada flea bane. Um, whereas six feet away, the photo on the right was taken, and you can see morning glories and pigweeds and velvet leaf. This is the same field, six feet apart. The only reason the weed species are different, the ones that broke through, is because of the way that the, the crop was managed. So, um, the first step in any good IPM program is to know what you're up against. So proper weed identification is important. Um, getting it down to the species is great if you can get it just to the genus or even if you can figure out if it's an annual or a perennial uh, grass or a broadleaf or a sedge. All of those things will be helpful when you come to, to manage the crop or the, the weed within your crop. To give you an example, this was a sweet potato farmer, and I'm sorry, I'm going to give you like a few sweet potato examples, um, just because that's a lot of the work that I've done in my past. But um, he, he told me he had grass in his field, and he wanted to know what to, what to do about it. Well, my office was about 30 minutes away, so I said, I'll just come take a look. And I did, and, and it turns out this wasn't grass at all. This was yellow and purple nutsedge. So the way that we would have managed grass is to just apply a, a grass selective herbicide over the top and, and walk away from it. Um, in this case, he actually had to uh, 
a portion of his field he, he just dissed and, and replanted. Um, and even after he did that, he still had a lot of weed issues. So this would be a portion of the field that he didn't disc and replant, but you can see the, the pressure that he had um, at the end of the season. So if he would have applied a graminicide or grass selective herbicide to this, he would have just been wasting his money and his time. Um, so the next thing is to understand the threshold. So how many weeds is too many? Um, obviously, if you had one nut sedge in that field, 100 acre field, you know, that's fine, right? Um, what about a million or two million? So understanding at what point there are too many weeds is an important thing to, to consider. So in that field, we set up a, a density experiment. So the orange flag is the row where we have our treatment. The uh, top left there would be a weed free where all the, the nut sedge were pulled out by hand throughout the season. Uh, 10 per square meter, which is about one per square foot. Uh, 30 per square meter, which is about three per square foot, and then 90 per square meter, or about nine per square foot. And this is what it did to yield. So our densities are on the bottom there. Um, this is percentage sweet potato yield loss. And at our lowest weed density, we're losing about 25, 30% of our marketable yield of the crop. So even at one nut sedge plant per square foot, um, we're seeing a, you know, a quarter of the crop is lost. That's too much, right? So it's obviously something that we need to manage. Another thing to consider when it comes to how competitive weeds are with our crop is where they're located. So in this kind of situation, if you look at plastic culture production systems, uh, if you have an upright crop or a crop that tends to stay in that, that planted row, uh, like in this case, this is again, annual plastic culture strawberry, but um, you can see there's vetch growing in the planting holes. So the, it, the weeds that pop up in the planting holes in this kind of system are going to be the most competitive because they're right there next to the crop. So if you had to prioritize which weeds to control, you'd wanna kind of focus on weeds that are in the planting holes first, maybe those that break through tears or in the shoulder of the plastic, and then row middles. Although weeds in the row middles can also have an impact on crops as well. Uh, when we, again, just a, a, a kind of a perennial fruit example, this is blackberry. Um, this would be a floricane blackberry. But in this kind of system, we manage the orchard floor in two different kind of distinct areas. The planted row, which we try to maintain vegetation free or weed free. And then the, the row middles, which are usually sodded or have feral vegetation. So this is just another example of, of um, kind of defining that edge um, within a field for where we maintain the spots weed free. Another thing to consider is timing. So within a number of crops, we have this thing called the critical period for weed control. And for most crops, that's going to be um, keeping the crop weed free until it has sufficient canopy to shade out the weeds that, that would emerge below it. So to give you an example, this is some work that I was a part of with uh, steak tomatoes, so slicing tomatoes, uh, marketable yield there on the X uh, or the Y axis right there. This would be weeks after transplanting. And so basically what we, we learned from this is that if we target our weed management to three to six weeks after transplanting, we can maintain something like 80, 85, 90% of our yield potential for marketable tomato yield. So if you are limited on your time and you can't keep your tomatoes weed free throughout the entire season, if the least you can do is keep them weed free for that period between three and six weeks after transplanting, you've maintained a large percentage of your yield potential. So if you're strapped on time, you know, focus on the early season um, weed management. So how do we manage weeds? There's lots of different ways and I, I would recommend that you look at multiple different approaches and we'll, we'll kind of touch on each of these in the next few slides. So one of the best things that I can recommend is sanitation and exclusion. So if you have weedy fields or weedy portions of a field and then you have portions and fields that aren't weedy, um, clean your equipment between, between fields or uh, within a field, if you're moving from a, a place that's heavily infested with weeds to a place that's not, you know, don't, don't move the weed propagules and seeds um, into portions of your field and the fields that are relatively clean. 
Um, so this is generally a good idea to remove plant parts and, and soil when you move between fields, um, just as general IPM for diseases and other things as well. Uh, when it comes to another aspect of exclusion is to use only seed sources that, that have been tested, you know, and don't have a uh, high amount of weed seeds or especially noxious weed seeds. So, um, you know, Nathan mentioned knowing where your hay comes from, for example, um, that can be a source of, of weed seeds. Um, this in, in the, the right photo there is some, some cereal rye cover crop seed that I, that I purchased and it's, you can kind of make out these tiny little green seeds. I believe those are uh, a foxtail species. So if I'm putting out this cover crop seed, I'm actually planting some foxtail along with it. Another thing to consider is we can manipulate things like between row and within row spacing to try to close canopy a little quicker. Uh, we can change planting date to, to, to uh, help us as well. Um, cultivar selection. So we'll show you some, some cultivar selection photos in the next couple slides. But for example, these are two uh, potatoes. Uh, the top one there has a really upright growth. And this is partly due because I think it was in the shade. Um, but the bottom one has a more bushy growth habit. And you, it's pretty apparent that the bottom one is going to be able to compete with weeds more effectively than the top one. Crop rotation is beneficial. The example that I gave with the sweet potato grower who had nut sedge, um, there are no efficacious herbicides for that weed in that cropping system. So what he did was he rotated the beans for three years where he had herbicides that he could use than to clean up the, the weed issues before he rotated back to a specialty crop. Um, the other thing is to ensure vigorous crop growth. So making the, sure the crop has everything it needs to be successful, um, not planting it if it's not time. Um, you, when you put it in the ground, you want it to be able to, to take off. So this is, uh, this is at the student farm this past winter. These are two varieties of spinach that are being grown. Um, and you can see that the one on the left is definitely filling its space more efficiently and keeping the weeds out far better. So Flamingo is the one on the left that has more of a kind of upright habit. It also had better germination. Uh, woodpecker on the right there is more uh, kind of laying down, um, had a, a little less um, good germination. And so, you know, if you cut these, you know, you're gonna be picking more weeds out of the, the, the salad grains that you're pulling off of the woodpecker plot. Just something to think about. Mulches, uh, we talked about mulches a little bit. Uh, I think Nathan had some of his uh, beds there that had some landscape fabric as a mulch. That's an option. Plastic mulches are an option as well. One of the things that as a small farm you can actually use are some of these carbon-based uh, mulches like straw and hay. Uh, if I were to suggest that to a, a larger farm, that I'd probably lose most of my credibility. They would just laugh at me. But for small farms, that's, that's a real option. Um, just making sure you know the source of it. So um, one, you're aware of any potential weed seed issues, but also there are herbicides that can be applied to, to hay fields and, and straw fields or wheat fields um, that could carry over to your crop. So just being aware of that. Uh, tree bark is an option and the landscape fabric as well. Uh, one thing that I noticed this spring is that, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a heavy believer in mulch, uh, carbon-based mulches, um, but one thing I saw in my spring broccoli was that where I had mulch, I also had more slug damage to my crop. So um, just, just be aware that there may be side effects to mulching, including uh, providing habitat for, in this case, slugs. You don't have to necessarily apply mulch from offsite. One way to do that onsite is to use cover crops and then to um, roll or crimp them. This is an example of cereal rye and uh, crimson clover from some of my work in Mississippi. I planted it, roller crimped it, and then uh, we actually planted soybeans into it. But a number of people in Indiana do this with some of their pumpkins as well and get some pretty effective weed control from it. Uh, so plastic mulch works pretty well, keeps uh, sunlight from helping some of the seeds germinate. There are some that will germinate without the sunlight, but they won't be able to get through the mulch. So it provides a physical barrier. Um, we think about it for vegetable crops, but other people have used it for, in this case, blueberries. Um, 
this is an example of using plastic mulch in Blackberry. So the, the center is plastic mulch and then landscape fabric is on the shoulders. And the reason that they do that is to allow these primocanes then to emerge through the, the plastic mulch. Um, they wouldn't be able to get through if, if it was entirely landscape fabric. Unfortunately, that plastic mulch does you know, decay after a while. And so you do start to see some weeds breaking through, in this case, uh, yellow nut sedge and dog fennel. So uh, we talked about this, the weeds within the row are the most problematic. So we need to make sure we control those uh, first and foremost. And one of the ways we do that is to try to limit the number of tears in our plastic and the, the size of the planting hole that we use. For example, this is a, a, a tear in the plastic to re repair the, the drip line. Um, and you can see it creates this void now uh, where weeds can emerge and compete with our crops. Uh, this is a, an example out of Plant City, Florida of some strawberries that they grow. Um, nice high tight beds. Um, and you know, just look at the, the planting holes are no bigger than, than they need to be to get the plug in, into the plastic. And look where the drip tape is coming out the end there. I mean, it's, it's hardly, uh, it's just, just big enough to get the drip tape through and not any extra space for weeds to, uh, to get through and compete with the crop. One of the weeds that doesn't compare, uh, doesn't care if you have uh, plastic mulch is yellow nut sedge, it'll just grow right through it. Um, it's a perennial uh, weed and it is growing through black plastic mulch. And in this case, it actually grew uh, into and through a cantaloupe that was on uh, plastic mulch as well. Cultivation is very handy. Um, a lot of us use between row cultivation. We need to target small weeds. A lot of times it'll uproot the weeds that are between the rows. Um, and hopefully we can throw enough soil back on top of the row that we bury some of the smaller germinating weed seedlings. Um, if you don't, you have the potential to have something like this where we didn't quite get enough soil thrown back in the row. And we have, um, in this case, pig weeds that are, that are still persisting. Other things people like to do or, or may mention is, is mowing. Um, mowing may be a technique that you can use to, to prevent uh, seed rain. If you have some escapes, maybe to keep them from going to seed. Um, but for the most part, I don't recommend it as a standalone practice. One, because we're managing the weed above the canopy of the crop. So we've already had competition for light resources. Um, and the other is that um, you know, for this example, this is a pigweed species. This is Palmer pigweed um, that has been mowed. It just then creates a bush. So you get more lateral growth. Um, we haven't really done much to manage the weed just by mowing it. Hand hoeing and hand weeding are, are used a lot, even in large commercial uh, specialty crops. But, you know, smaller farms can use this as well um, and probably use it to a greater extent. Um, you can hand weed exclusively if you want to, but I think that maybe one of the best uses is to use it to manage escaped weeds. So weeds that, that uh, escaped other treatments and then to have uh, a way to kind of manage weeds that are believed to be resistant. So the photo on the right is from a pumpkin patch of mine. Um, you can see that mare's tail, everything around it is dead. Um, died from a glyphosate application, but that mare's tail is, is still green and growing. So that's one that, that I'll go back through and, and pull up to avoid uh, one, having that competition from that weed, but also to avoid it from going to seed and having to deal with Roundup resistant uh, mare's tail in the future. Flame weeding is an option. Um, there's a good bit of research out there on flame weeding as far as uh, the temperatures that you need to be at and the, the duration of exposure. The other thing that we're starting to see um, a good bit of is electrocuting weeds. So electricity is, is also a, a a potential post-emergence weed management option. Um, a lot of the, the units right now are tractor mounted, but there are some backpack kind of uh, electric uh, wands as well that are coming on the market. Herbicides, um, I think I'm starting to, man, I feel like I'm going long, Petrus. Um, but so there's a lot of things to consider when, you, um, when you're thinking about herbicides. So is it between the row or within the row? For the perennial fruit crops, is it a bearing crop or non-bearing? That dictates what you can actually use. Um, broadcast or directed pre-emergence, meaning it's applied before the weeds emerge, or post-emergence, meaning it's applied, applied to emerged weeds. Broad spectrum or selective, and then systemic, meaning that it moves to the plant or contact 
essentially meaning that the herbicide kills the green tissue that it touches. So um, we touched on this. If you use pre-emergence herbicides, they require rainfall or irrigation to be activated. And essentially what that means is that the herbicide needs to move through the soil profile to where the weeds are actively germinating so that they can control them. Um, another thing is, so post-emergence are, again, applied to weeds that have, have, have emerged. And what we generally recommend is to apply to small weeds. And for our, our row crop folks, that means less than four inches. But for us, especially crops, a lot of times we'd like to target weeds that are even smaller than four inches. So general uh, considerations. So um, just some things to think about. You know, if, if you want to have a weed management system that's that is uh, that includes a lot of herbicides is to consider having a non-selective or burn down option so something like a, a roundup or you know a glyphosate or a glufosinate or a aim which is carfentrazone uh, one of those products that you can apply between rows or or before you plant um, a graminicide is, is a good option to have so there's select and post and generics of both of those products that you can apply over the top of of, of our broadleaf vegetable crops and not damage them, um, but, the, but it will only controls grasses. Pre-emergence products, if you're gonna select a pre-emergence product, um, such as Prowl or Dual or the two I have on here as examples because they have really broad labels. So if you're buying two and a half gallons of a herbicide that may cost two or $300, you wanna make sure you can use it across lots of different crops. Um, otherwise, you may, it may take you 10 years to, to go through that jug of uh, herbicide. Try to focus on herbicides that have uh, lower intermediate soil persistence and then uh, make sure you rotate modes of action so you can limit resistance. One of the things that uh, folks sometimes ask about is wicking or wiper applications of, of in this case, glyphosate. Uh, again, I don't love it because we're managing the weed above the canopy of the crop, which means we've already had some yield loss. In this example, this is called a Dixie wick, but you put the concentrated glyphosate solution in this tube, PVC tube, and it uh, comes out this, the perforation on this cotton canvas sleeve. Uh, you run it over the top of the, the weeds, and it actually, if you have uh, susceptible weed biotypes, it can do a pretty good job of controlling them, as you can see in these photos. The only problem is that they tend to drip, so you can get herbicide on your crop. And then, um, with something like pigweeds, they tend to have successive germination events. So even though you've controlled one round of, of weeds, you know, here comes a second. So it's not residual. You have to continually do it. Um, another thing to consider are shielded sprayers. So if you're making applications between row, they have uh, several versions of these, both for tractors and then for backpack sprayers as well. It helps you to get the herbicide on the weed, but hopefully not on your crop. Broad spectrum versus selective, you know, making sure you know which weeds are present. Uh, the photo on the left has some sedges, some grasses, some broad leaves. Uh, the photo on the right is just grass. So the photo on the right, you can come through with the grass selective herbicide and take care of your, your weeds without much issue. You're gonna have a little more trouble. You need something more broad uh, in its selection for the photo on the left. So be aware of crop rotation restrictions. This is uh, something, especially for small farms, that is important because we have a lot of diversity of our crops. We have relatively short cropping cycles, so you, you might get two or, or three crops in the ground, depending on what you're growing. Um, so pretty short turnaround, and there's a lack of information about how a number of the herbicides that we use uh, affect specialty crops. Um, so often the, on the label, you'll see kind of really conservative estimates, 18 months, 24 months rotation restrictions. Uh, and a lot of times that's because we just don't have data yet to support a, a shorter rotation. This is gonna vary with your soil type um, and just make sure you're aware of potential carryover effects. One that is really, um, that we see, that, we, that I've seen before is a stinger, it's clopyrrolid. It can be used on strawberries to control legume weeds. Um, growers who had annual plastic culture strawberries, they'd, they'd plant them in October, harvest them in May or June. Uh, and they'd want to take, just rip the plants out and put tomatoes in, in those holes. Um, and if you did that, you saw injury from carryover from stinger. So that's just one thing you couldn't do. So disregard the sunburn on these tomatoes or sun scald, but uh, you can see that that stinger carryover does affect tomato shape uh, and also 
damage the foliage as well. There are organic herbicide options. A lot of these are um, kind of acid-based products, so, or oils, and um, they're generally broad spectrum, non-selective, um, essentially burn green tissue. Um, so you wanna keep them off your crop. They're not gonna provide much residual. So if you're relying entirely on them, uh, you have to make multiple applications. One of the things that, that we like to see also are, are biological control organisms. So for weeds, most of the biological control is gonna come from uh, things that eat the weed seeds that are on the soil surface. So in this case, um, mice, for example, and, and different beetles and crickets can, can feed on um, the seeds that fall to the soil surface. To, so to encourage that, one of the things that we'd like to do is to uh, delay fall tillage or have reduced tillage so that the seeds are right on top of the ground where they can be eaten. And then uh, the other option, if you don't want to do that, is to bury your seeds deeply. Uh, Nathan mentioned, you know, sometimes cultivation can actually encourage more weeds, and that's because we're, we're moving weeds up in the soil profile where they can germinate. Um, one thing we also want to talk about is herbicide drift considerations. So we see a good bit more of this in the last several years with the introduction of dicamba tolerant soybeans. Um, and it's, it's problematic, especially if you are a small farmer who farms adjacent to larger uh, row crop agriculture. So just be aware of the potential for drift. Um, you can use something, a service like Driftwatch, for example, which you know, this is a, a screenshot of uh, the, some of the farms that were registered last year, and you can zoom in. People who apply, for example, dicamba on uh, soybeans are supposed to go to a website like this and make sure there are no sensitive crops around them. And if there are, they, they have restrictions on when they can spray and how much of a buffer there needs to be between their um, their application and, and your sensitive crop. So if you're not on one of these sites, it, it may be a good idea to go ahead and register your sensitive crops um, just so people who apply around you're aware. And then some, some resources. So if you want to look up different pesticide labels, cdms.net is, is the place I do that for specific um, recommendations on pests in general. The Midwest Vegetable Guide uh, is, is fantastic. The printed guide is really good. Uh, we also have for the pesticide part specifically, um, there's a new website that, that works really well for, for navigating recommendations on pesticides, Driftwatch. And then um, so for some more information about oxen herbicide drift, what you should do if, if you experience it, you know, how you might prepare for it. Um, the IPM Center, to the, the North Central IPM Center, um, has a, some really good fact sheets you can look at and it's hosted by the uh, Ohio State University. All right, that's my contact information.